If you live in Melbourne, you've probably heard about the devastating collapse of the Westgate Bridge in 1970. But what if I told you that there was another major road bridge that suffered a structural failure just eight years earlier? This is the story of the collapse of Melbourne's King Street Bridge. If you're unfamiliar with Melbourne, the Yarra River is the main body of water in the city. It flows directly south of the CBD and out into Port Phillip Bay. Almost since Melbourne's establishment in 1835, many ideas for bridges across here were proposed. Some were built, connecting various parts of the city together. Fast forward to November 1954, and Victoria, along with the rest of Australia, was in the throes of the post-Second World War boom. Melbourne was growing and changing rapidly, with one of the major shifts being a huge increase in the use of cars. At this time, the Victorian Parliament's Public Works Committee was looking at building new roads to make room for all of this traffic. And in 1954, one of its recommendations was that a new bridge be built over the Yarra River at the southern end of King Street. This proposal was given to the main road construction authority at the time, the Country Roads Board, who you may remember from some of my previous videos about freeways. The committee's report coincided with the release of the 1954 Melbourne Metropolitan Planning Scheme. This, separately, also recommended building a new bridge at King Street, along with another at Russell Street, to create a major arterial road through the CBD, connecting to Hannah Street in South Melbourne. You can see more on this topic in my previous video on the F1 freeway, which is just up here in the top right hand corner. The Country Roads Board, or CRB, did investigative work in the following year, and presented it back to the Public Works Committee. They then agreed to fund the bridge a year later in April 1956. After a tender process, the contract was awarded to Utah Australia Limited in January 1957 for £2,374,360.16 shillings, or about $81 million in today's money. Work began quickly on the 19th of September 1957. The design consisted of several components. These were an overpass for Flinders Street over King Street, associated access roads, the bridge itself over the river, and a continuation of the road through the Grand Street in South Melbourne, effectively reconstructing Hannah Street into what we know today as King's Way. The bridge was built in a design consisting of two parallel roadways, one east and one west, supported by piers with a reinforced concrete deck. Under the road itself were four suspended girders, carried by cantilevered girders, extending from the supporting piers. You can see some of the construction technique in this photo taken in 1959. As a bit of a side note, the historic Melbourne fish market was demolished for this project. This was to make way for a new road on the approach to the bridge, as well as to build a large surface car park. Today the area is Batman Park and Melbourne Aquarium, together with some newer buildings on Flinders Street. The King Street Bridge was officially opened to traffic seven months late on the 12th of April 1961, although it wasn't fully completed until the 18th of October. The final cost ended up being almost double the original contract at £4.1 million. But it wasn't smooth sailing for very long. Just after 11.15am on the 10th of July 1962, Ray Noble, a truck driver from Faulkner, began crossing the bridge from the south side on a routine trip. He was driving a low loader towing an excavator, which weighed about 35 tonnes. As he made his way over the north end of the bridge, the span suddenly collapsed with a loud crack. Luckily it was prevented from falling into the river entirely by the concrete structures underneath. Noble later said that he felt something shift and thought that his load had moved. He stopped the truck to investigate, but then saw that the road had buckled directly underneath him. Noble then jumped back into his truck and got off the bridge as quickly as possible. Probably the wise thing to do in that situation. The noise was loud enough to be heard right across the city and South Melbourne, bringing people out of their workplaces and houses to see what had happened. Within a couple of minutes, police had arrived and closed the bridge to all traffic. 
Engineers from the CRB and the Melbourne and Metropolitan Board of Works toiled through the night to install temporary wooden supports to prevent any further collapse. Amazingly, nobody was killed or injured. As I mentioned before, the entire span would have fallen into the river had it not fortunately been stopped by the concrete underneath. It quickly became clear that Noble was not at fault, and an investigation was immediately commenced to find out what had happened. A royal commission was also set up later in that year. During proceedings, the companies and organisations involved in the design and construction quickly attempted to avoid blame. The commission rejected this quite forcefully in their conclusion. While they did not believe that any specific individual was responsible for the collapse, they did find that the organisations were collectively responsible for the myriad of problems which they uncovered. The Commission found that the main cause of the failure were cracks in the welds on the span that collapsed. These cracks were due to the fabricator, Johns & Weygood Limited, not being familiar with how to correctly weld low alloy steel. The type of steel provided to them by BHP Limited was also too high in carbon and variable to allow a proper weld to be made in the first place. As a result, it was not able to resist the cracks that emerged. Even though these cracks had been in the girders since before the bridge was erected, inspections from both the fabricating company and the Country Roads Board should have picked this up. However, this was not done. Johns and Weygood Limited and the head contractor, Utah, placed pressure on the CRB to relax its inspection and testing practices, after the companies felt that the initial inspectors were being too overbearing. The commissioners were particularly scathing of their conduct, stating that, quote, We hardly know whom to blame more, J&W for its cavalier attitude, or the CRB for putting up with it. The other main finding was the type of contract that was used, which outsourced almost the entire bridge design and construction. No consulting engineer from the CRB was employed, so the same engineers from Utah would both design and supervise the project. The Royal Commission found that all four parties, Johns and Weygood, BHP, Utah and the Country Roads Board, did engage in conduct considered negligent. However, they did not find evidence of any culpable or improper activities. After the report was handed down, the bridge was rebuilt in a modified design. The Melbourne and Metropolitan Board of Works spent over £740,000 on reconstructing the bridge to make it safe, using John Holland as its contractor. This took a lot of work and the bridge did not fully reopen until the 30th of August 1965. The opening of the bridge dramatically increased traffic through St Kilda and South Melbourne, which paved the way for a range of other road projects and demolitions of parts of suburbs shortly thereafter. This included St Kilda Junction, the Nepean Highway and a series of freeway proposals from the 1969 Melbourne Transportation Plan. Probably the most surprising thing that I found while researching this video was how widely known this event became. This was mainly as the butt end of jokes, extending into mainstream media, to the point where it was parodied by several famous people in shows and bands. These included Zig and Zag, the hit song King Street Bridge by Bob King Crawford, and was even parodied by Spike Milligan as the main story in an episode of the Idiot's Weekly Radio Program, which was called the King Street Bridge Saga. Melbourne decided, if you'll pardon my chuckles, decided <laughs> to build a bridge. <laughs> Work on the bridge went steadily ahead. At first, they were three months behind schedule. But by hard work and government planning, they were soon six months behind. <laughs> I've included a link to the full show, which is one of the few that survive, in the description below. While the reconstructed bridge over the water remains in use today, the overpass at Flinders Street was removed in 2005 to improve local conditions. When Crown Casino was built in the 1990s and Yarra Bank Road was removed, the western access ramp from the north side was closed, with the south one repurposed as an access road into the casino's new underground car park, which is still in use today. You can see where the new ramp suddenly becomes steeper, which is where this new section was built to take it into the car park. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this and would like to see more, please subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on future videos. Also feel free to check out my website at philipmalice.com. 
Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.